Good morning, ladies and germs. Okay. Nice to see you all here in good appetite. Um, I remind you of the sacrifice I make for you in order to present in the evening. I skip the meal, which is unheard of, okay, in our family. Uh, but I do that for you guys so that I can teach you unimpeded. And uh, we have a, a walloping great show tonight for you. I hope you learn a lot. I hope you're challenged spiritually by it. Uh, the temples of Israel. Now, if some of you, if you were here last week, uh, you may have uh, noticed that I ran out of material about 7.30 and uh, tried to fill it with entertainment the rest of the half hour uh, unsuccessfully. And uh, Keith told me that I don't need to fill up the whole second hour. It could just take one hour. But guess what? Tonight, I'm sure that I have two hours worth of presentation. And we're going to get rolling here. And we're going to go kind of fast at the beginning, okay? Because uh, people have already seen this last week. But uh, if you weren't here last week, you can take a quick glance or be reminded. Uh, we're going to count the temples of Israel. And by the end of the evening, I want you to be able to tell me how many temples will Israel have uh, or have had, okay? So we're going to count the temples of Israel. We're going to start right now. And uh, uh, we'll start back uh, about 1500 BC. That's about 3,500 years ago with Moses and him getting instructions. And by the way, I'm going to fly through this, some of the, a lot of this material. I'm not, you know, like I've got a tabernacle up and usually people take three hours to go through the whole tabernacle diagram. We're not going to do that. We're going to notice a few things about this. And that is that 1500 BC, God gave Moses at uh, Mount Sinai uh, the instructions for the construction of the tabernacle. Now the tabernacle, the reason it's called that is because it was portable, okay? And it had to be carted around the desert and it had to be uh, a movable house of worship, all right? And you can see there the uh, altar of uh, burnt offering outside and the laver and uh, you can see the tabernacle building with its coverings and uh, you can see inside there a little bit, and there were two chambers inside, the holy place. And what was the other one called? You can participate here. The holy of holies. And what did the holy of holies have in it that no nothing else had? The ark, the ark of the covenant, thank you. And what part of the ark could you see from outside in the holy place? You can only see one part. The, the carrying rods, the ends of the carrying rods, right? Okay, and there's uh, a nice uh, full-up picture of the Ark of the Covenant, gold-covered, hammered gold. And what do you call those two angelic, angelic beings uh, covering the seat? Cherubim. cherubim, okay? I am in Hebrew is plural, all right? So that's more than one cherub, uh, cherubim, and uh, their job is to cover. And uh, they are there covering the throne of God on the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, lots of other things we could go into, but like I say, we're going to fly through this. Now, at the time of the conquest, which is about 1400 BC, and not led by Moses, but led by who? Who led the conquest? Joshua. What was his name? Joshua. Say it loud. Joshua. Joshua. Thank you, Martha. Okay. Uh, Joshua, all right. <clears throat> which is, by the way, the same name as Jesus, okay? But anyways, Joshua led the conquest into the promised land, and they took, of course, the tabernacle in, and they parked it at a place called Shiloh. Now, Shiloh in American history is very famous because there was a famous uh, little town of Shiloh in Tennessee. Ever heard of that? Yeah. And one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War was fought in Shiloh in 19, 1862. Okay, and uh, you know, so like in cowboy movies, sometimes if they're in the 1870s, you know, after the Civil War, they'll say, where'd you get that wound? Or where'd you get that gun? Or something like that. And the guy say, well, I got it at Shiloh. Okay, I got it at Shiloh. Shiloh was, was a bloodbath, okay, during the Civil War. Uh, but Shiloh here is where they parked the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Uh, God selected a king for th the people of Israel when they asked for it. First king was Saul, as you know. Uh, this is David, all right? And uh, David, once he settled down in Jerusalem, he had to, he had to capture Jerusalem. Uh, he had to build himself a house there. 
And once he kind of got a little bit older and uh, things settled down, the smoke you know, cleared, uh, he started planning for the construction of a permanent resting place for the Ark of the Covenant, meaning a temple, a permanent temple. He started planning for it. And who's that young man beside him that he's sharing his plans with? His son Solomon, very good. Okay, some of you were listening last week. I'm proud of you. (laughs) And there's some of the plans for the temple and the eventual construction of it. This, of course, is a model. Uh, And uh, it was a a beautiful temple. Uh, The rooms inside the holy place and the holy of holies extraordinarily were covered. The walls were covered in beaten gold. And everything was gold or silver or bronze. Can you name or can tell me two large objects that were in bronze? Now, there were several large objects in bronze. Uh, but bronze itself was a precious metal, okay? Not as precious as gold or silver, but it was very uh, expensive. And the, uh, uh, David was very proud of these two items that uh, got built right into the temple. Anybody want to risk telling us what they were? The two pillars, okay? Anybody name the two pillars? Boaz and Jacob, okay? And they were enormous pillars. Uh, they were, uh, now I asked you a question, a, uh, a structural question last week. Did you catch that? I said, now all you structural engineers here and contractors and builders and, you know, uh, I've got a question for you, okay? And I have not solved that because they show you different varieties, you know, of temples. Were the temples, or were the pillars, sorry, the bronze pillars, were they weight-bearing or not? okay, or ornamental? That's my question, all right? So if you think you got the answer for that, see me at halftime and uh, let me know, and maybe I'll let you speak to that, okay? Uh, But uh, anyways, uh, David uh, had to die, obviously, at some point, and what he's doing is he's passing along all of the materials that he's accumulated, all of the plans, all of the desire to see that temple built, all right? And so he dies about 971 BC, and Solomon inherits the job. And there is a, uh, you know, version of uh, Solomon's temple. Now, do you see the two pillars? You see the two pillars, Boaz and Jacob? Okay. Do you see the portable uh, altar, the uh, altar of burnt offering right there in, in the foreground? How do you know it's portable? Because it has... Wheels, okay, now in the background is the permanent stone built uh, uh, altar of uh, burnt offering, and you notice that it's an elevated thing, <clears throat> about two stories high, and there are priests up there on the sort of uh, runway around the edge, and there would be a big iron grating for them to put the animals on that would be sacrificed and burnt up there. Okay, and uh, so this was going to be a tremendous time of uh, celebration, and uh, Uh, observation and uh, just uh, a wonderful time. Solomon puts on a wonderful party, okay, for the dedication of the temple. And this would be about uh, 931 BC, I think, Uh, in between 931 and 971. uh, uh, You know, in other words, 900 years before Christ. And a highlight of the dedication was the Shekinah glory of God actually coming down from heaven and uh, inhabiting the temple, uh, not uh, permanently, but at least on this occasion. And so the priests couldn't even go in and work. Uh, So this was a glorious, glorious affair, the first temple of Israel, all right? So, so far we have one temple. Now, would you want to go into the temple when the Shekinah glory of God was inhabiting it? Probably not, okay? Uh, Because we still inhabit our uh, old bodies with their sin natures, and uh, we, we, we're incompatible with the presence of God. We can't, we can't go into the uh, perfect presence of God because we are imperfect, so imperfect that it would be fatal to us. Moses wanted to see the glory of God up close, and God said, no, you, you can't do that, Moses, I'm sorry. You know, you don't have your new body yet and uh, uh, it'll be fatal to you, so I'll just show you part of my glory passing by you. Um, Solomon uh, prayed for, it seems like two or three chapters, 
And in the prayer is that famous verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Uh, if my people that are called by my name shall, you know, repent. And uh, I think there's about four things they have to do. Repent and pray and seek my face. Uh, I will hear them and I will um, heal their land. Okay, and so a lot of people uh, here in America like to claim that verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14 as a verse for America, if Americans would wake up and repent of their sins, God would heal our land. And there is Solomon <coughs> dedicating the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. There are two parallel accounts of the dedication of the temple. One is in 1 Kings and the other one is in uh, 2 Chronicles. Uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, for they are for the most part parallel, but there are uh, sometimes differing details between them. Uh, so uh, Solomon was very happy. Uh, he kind of goes astray in, in the last couple of decades of his life, uh, accumulates too many wives and too many horses, and uh, uh, gets himself into trouble, uh, straying from the path that his father had stayed on. His father David had sinned, great sins, but he had always come back from them. You know what I mean? And Solomon, when he strays in his sins, you know, uh, with these pagan wives, for example, and worshiping their pagan idols, uh, he doesn't come back from it. That was the difference with Solomon. So um, God said, uh, Solomon, I'm going to have to deal with you. But you know what? Because of your father, I'm going to deal with your son, not with you. And his son was Rehoboam. And uh, Rehoboam met with uh, all ten, 12 tribes, uh, at the beginning of his reign, and he says, uh, okay, guys, uh, are you ready to uh, pay your taxes and, uh, you know, uh, be loyal to me? And uh, they say, well, we want to have a word with you about that, O king. You know, now this is Rehoboam, okay, the son of Solomon. And they say to him, you know, he says, what, what do you want? What do you want? And he, they say, well, look, Solomon, your father was really kind of tough on us and, you know, really taxed us at a high rate. Okay, and uh, governments have to be careful, by the way, about overtaxing their people. If you overtax people, they get discouraged and you create a black market and people stop paying their taxes and they, they find out all kinds of ways not to pay their taxes, okay? And then you actually have less money. If you undertax, okay, or tax at a lower rate, uh, often what happens is you stimulate, you know, the economy because people have a little more money to spend on themselves and uh, if, you, if you, you have more people to tax, you actually wind up with more money than less money. Have you guys heard conversations like that the last couple of weeks and months here? Yeah, oh yeah, in America, same thing. Okay, because it's always tempting to people to raise the taxes. They think, I'm gonna get more money for the government if I raise the taxes, but it doesn't always work that way. Uh, and uh, we know one guy who, like uh, is a politician uh, recently elected, but uh, he's not a professional politician, and you can tell the difference. He's, he's a businessman, okay? And uh, you, can, you know, his attitude toward taxing people is completely different than that of the professional politician class that have you know, inhabited Washington for the past uh, 50 years or so, okay? Uh, now, <clears throat> uh, Rehoboam comes back to the 12 tribes and he says, uh, you guys, I'm going to tell you what, you know, my father Solomon was pretty hard on you, but I'm going to be even tougher on you. I'm going to tax you even more, okay? Uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it, it's going to be kind of rough on you. And so, well, they take that in and kind of digest it and decide, uh, well, we're not so sure we, we really want to stick with you, Rehoboam. Uh, so we think maybe we'll break off. There's this guy over here called Jeroboam. And he's been in Egypt for the last 10, 20 years, waiting for your father to die. And, you know, he's proposing to lead us uh, in uh, your stead. And uh, so we think we'll go with him. And so 10 of the tribes broke away. Okay, and this is the end of the United Kingdom uh, with uh, the three kings, Saul, David, Solomon, only three kings of the United Kingdom. And then in 931, uh, they break up under Rehoboam. Uh, Rehoboam sends an army down to fight with the 10 tribes, bring them back. But God says to him, and Rehoboam actually listens. He says, uh, Rehoboam, don't do that. This is from me, okay? It'll work out better for you if you don't send your army down there. 
You just take care of your two tribes. Now, what two tribes did Rehoboam have? He had Judah and Benjamin and the capital city of Jerusalem and the temple. Uh, and the 10 tribes, uh, they didn't have any sort of uh, extensive, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure. Uh, now, Jeroboam does kind of a bad thing uh, at the very beginning. Okay, this is just to tell you that he had 10 tribes and uh, Rehoboam had two tribes. And uh, Jeroboam went out and made a couple of golden calves, put one in the north and one in the south of his kingdom. Now, uh, this is complicated, okay? So follow me closely here. There are now two Jewish kingdoms, all right? The northern kingdom under Jeroboam is the kingdom of Israel, all right? Sometimes later called Samaria because they bought a hill called Semer, built a capital city called Samaria on it. And so you have uh, the northern kingdom of Samaria with 10 tribes and two golden calves. And you have the southern kingdom of Israel, uh, really the southern kingdom of Judah, okay, we're going to call it. And you have the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin down there with the Davidic line of kings. Meaning, in the south, they had the line of kings that would eventually produce the Messiah, okay? They weren't going to get the Messiah from up north. They were going to get him from down south, even though they only had the two tribes, because they had the two royal tribes of Benjamin and Judah. Uh, okay, and up north, they had 19 kings, and uh, they were all bad. And you can read about them in First and Second Kings, okay? And then their, their tragic end. Uh, and uh, down south, they had some good kings, so they lasted longer. And uh, both kingdoms would succumb to idolatry and sinfulness and foreign conquest eventually, just in a couple hundred years. Maybe we'll even see that. Now, here's the United Kingdom under the first three kings, and then it breaks up under Rehoboam and Jeroboam, okay? Now, we've already explained that, so you know all about that. And... Now, in the 800s, there's a rising power from the north, north of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, and it's the power of Assyria. And the Assyrians were the bad boys of history. Uh, they loved to pile up skulls outside cities. They loved to impale people outside the city walls. Uh, they were the first ones to develop effective siege warfare. They had machines that would dig holes in your wall, and they would get through. And uh, if you were still fighting with them, they would kill you all and uh, sell you all into slavery. And uh, they used transportation also as a method of uh, dealing with uh, populations. In other words, they would transfer the populations. Now, Assyria gets closer and closer to the northern kingdom in 722. This is a big important date in Israel's history, if you're interested in Israel's history. 722 BC is the conquest of the northern kingdom by Assyria, okay? So what do they conquer? Ten tribes, two golden calves, right? And Jeroboam's descendants. But Jeroboam himself is not there anymore or his sons because up north they had several dynastic changes, you know, changes of family, okay? In the south, they kept the same family, just barely, David's family, all the way through to uh, their destruction. So 722, Assyria takes over the north. Uh, obviously, they kill a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people flee south. A lot of refugees from the 10 tribes went south, uh, including all of the Levites and stuff like that. They go south to Jerusalem for shelter uh, and uh, refuge away from the Assyrians, and they get it. And they continue on down, uh, you know, their lines of their, their tribal descendants mixed in with the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah <clears throat> down south. Uh, Assyria takes all of the rest of the people up north, and it moves them, like I told you, uh, and it moves them to another part of the Assyrian Empire, and there are various stories, many, many stories about these 10 tribes, and commonly they are called the missing 10 tribes, okay? And uh, there's all kinds of stories. There's one story about the British people being the lost 10 tribes of Israel, okay? Uh, the Mormons, I think, uh, thought the uh, Indians over here were the lost 10 tribes of Israel, all right? I read a book recently about a Kurdish Jewish family. Now, I have a son who works in Kurdistan, okay? So I know a little bit about Kurdistan. And uh, this book was all about this Kurdish Jewish family getting kicked out of uh, Kurdistan, which was Iraq, okay? It was a province in Iraq. 
1948. Now, why were they kicked out in 1948? Why would a Jewish family get kicked out of Iraq in 1948? Because Israel just became a country. And the Arabs hated it. And they kicked out all the Jews in their population, in their, their countries, all through the Middle East. Jews were kicked out all over the place and um, had to try to get to Israel. And that's sort of an unknown story about Israel, by the way, okay? <clears throat> we all know Arabs left their places and took, you know, eventually wound up in camps administered by the United Nations, and they're still there today, the grandchildren of the refugees from 1948. They're the only case of refugees handing down their status to their children and grandchildren. That's not what usually happens. Seven million Germans were kicked out of Poland at the end of World War II by the Russians. Okay, guess where they went? They went to Germany. Guess what they did? They settled among the German population. They were German. Guess where they are today? They're all mixed in with the population part of the country of Germany today. No, no problem, okay? All the problems are over with now because they worked on it at the time. The Arabs did not. They're still sitting in refugee camps today, okay? But the Jews, what happened was Israel said, we're going to have a funny, different kind of country here. It's a Jewish homeland country. And that means that any Jew in the world who comes here to Israel and sets foot, once they get off the airplane and their feet touch the tarmac, they are automatically Israeli citizens. You ever heard of a country like that before? Never, ever, okay? The only country in history that's ever done anything like that. They took them all in. Israel was weak in 1948. Israel was poor in 1948. Israel barely had any kind of an army, any kind of an economy, any kind of a government. They put up tent cities for these refugees from the Middle East. And they took them in. And uh, number one job was to start teaching them Hebrew. Hebrew. Think about that, okay? And, uh, you know, then health and education and integrating them into the country. And, and guess where they are today? They're all integrated into Israel today. And their children and grandchildren are not refugees, but they're, you know, uh, productive members of Israeli society. Uh, so that's a little unknown story. And this Kurdish family that was kicked out, they thought they were part of the Lost Ten Tribes. But uh, my own personal opinion, I'm not a great scholar, not any, anything famous, but I have a few opinions about a few things in the Bible. Not, not many, a few. And one of them is whether these Kurdish Jewish people would actually qualify as uh, possible candidates for the 10 tribes, the lost 10 tribes of Israel. And I, I don't think they would be. You know why? Because they were still devoutly Jewish. The lost 10 tribes, when they got transported by the Assyrians, they were for all effective purposes pagans. They were thoroughly paganized, thoroughly immersed in idol worship. They did not have any trace of Judaism in the lost 10 tribes, the 10 tribes up there in the north of Israel. When, so, you know, wherever they went, I think what happened was they got assimilated into the local populations. And that's just an opinion, okay? So you may have another uh, idea. But anyways, Assyria gets the northern kingdom. And there's Assyrian soldiers, and uh, uh, it's really interesting. They, they've got a lot, they show a lot of technical detail in these drawings, in these uh, friezes and sketches and uh, statues of the Assyrians. And uh, remember what I said earlier, the Assyrians were the first to develop, uh, uh, you know, uh, siege warfare. If anybody had a fortified city, usually they were safe in those days. But the Assyrians were the first ones to make machines to break through the walls. Now, the southern kingdom continued on beyond uh, the Assyrians, uh, but unfortunately, they too fell into idolatry. And um, we, don't, we don't know why, I don't know why exactly, but idolatry was, um, it was all over the place, it was in every culture, um, and it was all in all facets of life, home life, work life, education, everything, entertainment, everything was saturated by idolatry. And uh, so it was universal, it was all around you, it was everywhere. And it was often very attractive. The temples, remember I've mentioned to you, were sort of party places of, uh, you know, drunkenness and temple prostitution and music and dancing girls and, you know, lots and lots of interesting stuff. And so people fell into idolatry and the, the Judeans in the southern kingdom, unfortunately, fall into idolatry. Now, if you don't believe me, 
believe Ezekiel, okay? You read Ezekiel, and in the opening 10 chapters, he documents the fallenness of his kingdom of Judah, how bad it was. And he says at one place, somebody told me dig a hole in the wall here of the temple, okay? Now, I don't know how he could do that, but anyways, <laughs> dig a hole in the wall of the temple, and then you look inside, and, and then he says inside were all kinds of horrors of idolatry, okay? I'm not going to talk about them here tonight. You can look them up, all right? Now, one of the idols is the idol of Moloch, and that was the one that was involved in chilled child sacrifice, a horrible, horrible, horrible religion, you know? Don't let anybody tell you that all religions are the same, okay? And they all lead to God. Uh, they don't. Uh, they, the rest of them lead to hell. And some of them go directly to hell, by the way. <clears throat> um, 100 years later, the Babylonians, they become a rising power, and they lean on the Assyrians. They capture the Assyrian capital city. Somebody tell me, what's the Assyrian capital city? Thank you, Nineveh. Who preached there? Jonah for four chapters, remember? They repented. Was Jonah happy? Is celebratory? Hey, they repented. No, he was very unhappy with the Lord. He, said, he says, God, I told you this. I told you they would do that. And you're a forgiving God. And you're going to forgive them now, blah, blah, blah. And he was just really angry with God for forgiving the Ninevites. And there's a layout of the Assyrian Empire. What I want you to see here is that Babylonia was a little further away from uh, Judea than Assyria was. Babylonia is further down the what they call the Fertile Crescent, or Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia being the land between the rivers of Euphrates and uh, what's the other one? The Tigris. Thank you very much. The Tigris leads up north into uh, uh, Assyrian land. Uh, it goes by the ruins of Nineveh. There's a big city there today. There was a missionary from Valley Baptist. She was killed there in 2006. Uh, any of you know what the city was? It was the city of, there was a big battle there between our forces and uh, the Iraqi army and ISIS. ISIS being a very fundamentalist Muslim group. Um, it was Karen, what was her name, Karen? Thank you, yeah. And uh, uh, I remember one time early in my career here in Bakersfield, I went on a five kilometer walk. I can't believe I did that about uh, 10 or 12 years ago from Valley Baptist around the neighborhood uh, to commemorate her. And uh, yeah, so uh, Mosul and Nineveh are up the Tigris River, and uh, you have to walk. You, you would not go straight, see the map, you wouldn't go straight from Babylonia to Israel. You see that? See all that white stuff in between? Yeah, guess what that is? That's not snow. That's sand, desert, hot, heat, okay? Watch uh, the movie Lawrence of Arabia sometime, okay? And they're out on that desert. And uh, somebody doesn't come in by sunrise, they, they're, they're lost, they're dead. You gotta get in under shelter by sunrise, okay? Out there in that desert. So they would walk up the rivers because then you're close to water and it's cooler, and you go, but you gotta go way up out of your way and then come back down on the other side, and that's why it's called a crescent, okay? The fertile crescent. Uh, now the Babylonians are becoming powerful. They've taken Nineveh. And uh, in 605, they fight a big battle. Now, you're not interested in battles. You don't want to know about that. But the Babylonians defeated the Egyptians and Assyrians together at Kar Chemesh. Now, to ancient historians, that's a big deal. This is a big battle. It's a turning point battle. Things rise, rose, and fall, fell on the strength of this battle. The Assyrians and Egyptians fell. The Babylonians rose under their new commander, their new king, Nebuchadnezzar, all right? Uh, and uh, if you uh, didn't think that he was fierce and strong, just say his name a couple of times, okay? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what you do after a big battle, if you win, is you look around, you say, okay, what can I uh, pick up now freely without having to fight for it, okay? And you know what he did? He went to Judah. And he goes to Jerusalem and Lachish, there are two big cities there. And he says, okay, you guys want to join my empire? And they say, well, you know, not too terribly. He said, well, I just won this big battle. Do you want me to fight a big battle with you? No, not really. Uh, well, he said, you know, if you give me some money, a certain amount of money every year, protection money, tribute, if you give me some hostages, okay, 
I will add you to my empire, and, and I'll, you come under my protection. You come under my wings, okay? So if anybody invades here, I will protect you against them. Uh, okay, well, how much? Well, okay, so they worked out an amount. And uh, he added little Judah to his budding Babylonian empire, okay, without fighting in 605 BC. Now, this is what I want you to know. The Babylonian army marched around the Fertile Crescent three times, okay, in its uh, career with Judah, all right? Uh, because, you know, sometimes these pagans get a bad name, you know, for, you know, uh, destroying things and stuff. And certainly the Babylonians were no angels, but they weren't as bad as the Assyrians. And the thing was, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar showed a lot of patience, more patience than I would have, with the little Jewish kingdom of Judah, okay? Because in 605, they make an agreement. And they provide hostages from the best families of Judah. Okay, guess who one of the hostages was? A 16-year-old boy named Daniel, okay? And his three companions and others. And they, got, they, get, they you know, marched with the Babylonian army. Now it's bat, won a battle against the Egyptian, you know, Carchemish, and they've added Judah to their empire and they left a garrison down there and then the rest of the army starts marching home. Daniel with them. And as he came around the Fertile Crescent and down the rivers, he would see the marvelous, beautiful, fantastic city of Babylon rising in the distance, okay? Because it's right over the rivers, all right? And it has high walls, okay? You know, 30 feet, that's a pretty high wall. They had like 50-foot walls, okay, all around Babylon. And not only that, in places they had learned how to glaze the bricks. And so they uh, had beautiful glazed bricks of different colors along the walls that would shine in the light and that were just, you know, you know, spectacular. And as you got closer, you would see in the center of the town a rising mound, okay? And it would have lots of greenery on it, lots of vegetation, lots of trees and stuff. And as you got closer, you would see that it was a ziggurat, okay? A stepped pyramid, and that it was fully foliaged. It was a garden, it was a beautiful. And the story was that Nebuchadnezzar, one of his wives, missed her hill home and the trees on the hills and the bushes. And so he said, well, I'll build you a hill and put trees and bushes on it for you, okay? And that became the famous, guess what? Hanging Gardens of Babylon. The famous Hanging Gardens of Babylon that the Greek historian Herodotus takes and he's cataloging the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, you know, like the Pharos, the lighthouse down in Alexandria, Egypt, that was a fabulous thing. Like the Colossus of Rhodes, okay? and uh, the Hanging Gardens of, um, of uh, Babylon. And uh, so this is what Daniel would have seen, and it would have made quite an impression on him. And the wonder is that Daniel had enough gumption left, you know, when the eunuchs came to start his training and his grooming for government service. You see, that was why he was brought to Babylon, okay? Partly as a hostage to guarantee the good behavior of the kingdom of Judah, but also because you, you, you know, if you were a king, very often you would pick foreigners to train for your personal bodyguard. Why? Because they can't speak to the locals. They can't conspire with anybody. The only person they can speak to is you. So that's good. And uh, same thing in government. You train them for government. <clears throat> Daniel was going to be trained for government. The eunuch offered him all this food and wine, and Daniel said, hey, no, you know the story. Uh, just give us some vegetables and water, and in a couple of weeks, check us out and see if we're okay. And if we're okay, if we're good to go, then just uh, keep that diet up, and we'll do what you want. We'll learn what you want. And the eunuch said, you know, it's my head, right? It's my head, Daniel, here that we're talking about. Uh, and uh, I like it being fastened on, you know, tight. And uh, Daniel says, don't worry, okay? God will take care of you and us. And somehow the guy was reassured, and he let Daniel do that, practice that vegetable diet, okay? Uh, and uh, so uh, Daniel is there from 605 BC on, all right? Uh, but that's not the end of the story. Nebuchadnezzar puts a king in stall, you know, in, in Jerusalem, and uh, he, uh, the king rebels against him. And Nebuchadnezzar has to come back a second time. Okay, so notice the dates there, 598 to 597. His second visit, he comes back a second time. And I would have thought that this time he'd be pretty angry. I'd be pretty angry after marching uh, 1,800 miles back and forth on the, you know, wouldn't you? You know, if, even if you could ride in a carriage or on a horse. And uh, he gets back uh, and he lays siege to Jerusalem. 
And the king, Jerichoian Jer- 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 Chin, okay, uh, has a sudden fit of reality and says, oh man, look at the Babylonian army out there building their siege works against us. I don't know if I'm really prepared to take them on. Uh, let's go talk to them. So he goes and talks to them, and he talks his way out of them assaulting the city. And, uh, uh, but they did take him off the throne and put somebody else on the throne because after all, he had rebelled. But they didn't kill him or anything. They were actually, I think, uh, fairly generous by the standards of the time. So that's two times, you got this, okay? The Babylonian army has been around the Fertile Crescent, okay, two times to mess with the kingdom of Judah. Uh, And uh, so everything should be cool now. Nebuchadnezzar marches all the way back home, 800 miles back home. Uh, And uh, Ezekiel, though, uh, is accompanying him from the second visit, okay? Ezekiel gets pulled out as a hostage. He takes more hostages. And Ezekiel goes back to uh, Babylon with him. And there Ezekiel uh, is praying one day, and he has these tremendous visions. You see them at the beginning of Ezekiel, the first four or five chapters, the wheels within wheels, you know, that some people think were, you know, UFOs and uh, visions of the four living creatures. And also the Shekinah glory of God. Now, the last time we saw the Shekinah glory of God was 300 years before. What was it doing? It was descending into the temple, right? Am I right? Okay, now what's it doing this time? It's leaving the temple, okay? Now, if you were a good Jewish person, not an idolater, but a good Jewish person, you love the Lord, how would that make you feel seeing the Shekinah glory of God leaving the temple? It would send shivers down your back. It, it, you know, Ezekiel knew this was a horrible sign, okay? the glory of God leaving the temple in Jerusalem. Now, he was seeing it by vision, because he was in Babylon, okay? Uh, But the vision was true, and um, uh, the first 10 chapters of Ezekiel document the stopping points of the Shekinah glory, okay? And it goes from, like, the Holy of Holies to the threshold of the temple, and then the threshold of the temple to the um, uh, city, And then from the city, it departs from the city into the hills. And the Shekinah glory of God is completely gone after 10 chapters in Ezekiel. Um, And uh, so uh, Ezekiel uh, documents that in his book. And uh, now Nebuchadnezzar, um, he has put another king there since the second visit. Uh, And that king, Zedekiah, decides he's going to rebel. He's going to try his chances at rebellion. Uh, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes around the Fertile Crescent a third time in 587 B.C., and he sets up the siege works against the city, okay? And uh, Zedekiah does a very interesting thing. Um, he, uh, it, it's recorded in the book of Jeremiah, okay? He goes to see Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah has been in prison for being a traitor, because he has been preaching to the Jewish people of Jerusalem, don't fight the Babylonians. See, Jeremiah knew the Babylonians were the instrument of God's punishment. So if the Jewish people would fight the Babylonians, they were fighting against God's just punishment to them for their idolatry, okay? (laughs) Jeremiah knew they had to undergo that degree of punishment in order to be redeemed, okay? And so he's telling them, Surrender to the Babylon, you'll save your lives, okay? Fight and you'll die. Surrender, you'll save the city, you'll save the temple. Fight and you'll lose the city, it'll be burned and the temple will be burned, okay? Is that what you want? No, okay, so, you know, don't fight. But there were a lot of hotheads, young officers, you know, official, government officials, wanted to make their reputation, stuff like that. And they were saying, Jeremiah, he's a traitor, shut him up, you know? And at one point they, throw him down, it's like a well or something, it's got, you know, mud, mire, he sinks up to his armpits in the mire, okay? And he probably would die there after a couple of days, uh, except that uh, somebody went and told the king, and the king said, send some guys at night, you know? And uh, they go into all kinds of details, they say, okay, we're gonna throw some rags down, Jeremiah, put the rags under your arms, and these ropes under your arms, and we're gonna pull you up. They pull him out, okay? So he is mired in all of this mud, and he gets out and he appears before the king. The king says, I can't 
stand the sight of you, Jeremiah. Get yourself into the palace prison, okay? And I guess he cleaned himself up a little bit there. And a day or two later, Zedekiah, the king, goes to see Jeremiah secretly at night. And he says, Jeremiah, I don't want you talking about this, okay? But I want you to tell me what's going to happen. Jeremiah says, I can't tell you what's going to happen, your highness, because you'll kill me. And the king says, no, no, I promise I won't kill you. Just tell me whatever it is, okay? And Jeremiah says, are you sure if you want to hear this, okay? And Zedekiah says, yes, I want to hear, I want to hear. What should I do? What should I do? And Jeremiah says, I will tell you what the Lord says, okay? The Lord says to surrender to the Babylonian king, and you will be saved. You will live. Your family will live. The city will live, and the temple will be spared. But if you fight, you will be killed. Your family will be killed. The city will be burned, and the temple will be destroyed. Okay? So take your choice. So Zedekiah says, oh, man, this is really bad. What am I going to do? And he says, because these, all these officers over here, they want me to fight. And you know what will happen? They'll, they'll kill me if I don't fight. And Jeremiah says, well, you do what you, you, know, you, what you have to do. Okay, but I'm telling you what the Lord has told you and how to save your butt, okay? It's to surrender. It's not the patriotic thing. It's not the natural thing. It's not what a warrior would like to do, you know, go out fighting or something, but it'll save your city and the temple. Do you want to save it or not, okay? Zedekiah says, well, I got to think about this. Jeremiah, don't tell them what you said to me, okay? This is all in Jeremiah, all this secret negotiation, Okay. And uh, he even tells Jeremiah what to say. He says, look, if they come and ask you what you told me, just tell them that uh, you were asking me if uh, I could move you to another room or something, you know? And you make up something like that. And they did come, and Jeremiah told them what the king told him to say. And so they went away sort of kind of happy that Jeremiah had not inspired him to surrender. So Zedekiah, he's still sitting on the throne, still being advised by these guys, and he continues the fight. Well, 2 Kings chapter 24 goes into the horrible details, all right? The Babylonians breach the walls. Now, <clears throat> once the walls are breached, uh, it is hell to pay with the besieging army because the way they motivate their soldiers is by saying, if we have to fight our way through a breach in the walls, which will kill half of us, okay, or half of you, uh, the storming party, let's say, uh, the rest of you can uh, claim whatever you can find in the city, okay? The city will be up for sacking for like three days or seven days or four days, okay? And whatever you find, whatever you can get, you can do or find or keep inside the city. So the storming party and the invading army will be motivated. They're going to fight their way through, all right? And after two years of siege, the inside army is weak from hunger, okay? Okay. And then, you know, all kinds of horrors break out in a besieged city. Cannibalism, for example, you know, murder, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, different parties killing each other. Uh, that's what happened in Jerusalem, 70 to 72 AD, when the Romans were besieging it. The, the, the uh, zealots went around uh, killing everybody else, all the moderate Jews inside Jerusalem. And those uh, casualty figures that you hear were not all killed by Romans. A lot of them were killed by other Jews, namely the, the uh, zealots. So meanwhile, back in uh, you know, uh, Jerusalem, besieged by Babylon, uh, the king tries to escape. Now he's got a secret gate, okay? So he gets out, it's nighttime, and he sneaks out by his secret gate with some of his guards, and they make it down to the plain of Jericho. So they, they get some distance away. It's a little way. Jericho is what, 10 miles, I think, from Jerusalem? something like that, and they get down there, but then they're in the open. And the Babylonian army uh, soon, you know, cottons to what's going on and, you know, pursues him and catches him in the open, and all of his guards are gone, all of his soldiers are gone, and he's captured by the Babylonian soldiers. They bring him in the daylight back up to Nebuchadnezzar at Riblah, okay? And he's going to come before Nebuchadnezzar for judgment. Has he done some bad things? Yes, he has, okay? He has led the rebellion to the very, it's cost Nebuchadnezzar valuable soldiers, valuable time, valuable treasure, you know, besieging Jerusalem, okay? This is, you know, this is Zedekiah. Why did you have to? So Zedekiah comes before him and King Nebuchadnezzar designing the most horrible torture execution you can imagine, okay? 
uh, <coughs> carts his sons out in front of him. And then he kills the sons in front of him, Zedekiah, and then puts Zedekiah's eyes out and puts him in bronze fetters to be transported to Babylon. So the last thing he would remember, the last thing he ever saw was his sons being put to death. And um, <coughs> so there's Jeremiah conferring with uh, Zedekiah, and uh, all he has is difficult advice for him. And uh, this is the end that I've just described. And uh, here's Zedekiah being led away by the Babylonian soldiers and uh, a couple of his sons on the ground behind him. It must have been a terrible, terrible uh, way for Zedekiah to end. Zedekiah's real sin was his weakness, right? Now, um, let's see what happens to the city. The Babylonian king left his captain of the guard, another guy with a great name, Nebuzaradan. Don't you love those names? In charge of the punishment of Jerusalem. He supervised the burning of the king's house and of the house of the Lord, the temple, Solomon's temple. They burned all of the houses of the great and gathered up the survivors to ship them off to Babylon. They weren't going to leave many people behind this time. Uh, they were going to take most of them to Babylon. But they separated out any Jews who had anything to do with their army and government that had resisted the Babylonians, and they executed them as a group. These were government officials, military officials, who had led the resistance against them. They also separated out another whole group of what they call in the uh, King James, the New King James Version, defectors. Now, these were uh, Jews who had gone over to the Babylonians uh, during, you know, the whole rebellion, instead of staying in the city of Jerusalem, they had gone over. In fact, Zedekiah expresses to Jeremiah his fear of them. He says, don't hand me over to the defectors. They, they'll, they'll kill me, okay, because they're, they're now loyal to the Babylonians. And Jeremiah says, we won't do that, all right? Uh, they took all of the bronze vessels and instruments from the temple for shipment to Babylon. And it, you know, catalogs them all in a systematic way. They actually broke the two bronze pillars into pieces, also for shipment to Babylon. The Ark of the Covenant is not mentioned, all right? And uh, so its last mention is previously, you know, during, uh, I'm not sure what, uh, a refurbishing of the temple, maybe in the 800s, it's mentioned. And uh, then it's put back in the Holy of Holies, and presumably it was there. Now, uh, we make movies about the Ark of the Covenant. We wonder where it is. Uh, Hitler wants to get it so he can win World War II. And, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff about the Ark of the Covenant, right? It's like real curiosity. You know, everybody's interested in that. What do you think happened to the Ark of the Covenant? Mm -hmm. Well, we know one thing. The Babylonians didn't get it because they, they, would have, they would have said they got it. They would have mentioned it. It would be mentioned in the biblical accounts. Also, Ezra and Nehemiah do not list it coming back from Babylon or Persia, okay? After Cyrus releases them to go back, it's not mentioned. So the Ark of the Covenant is not in sight when the Babylonians break into the temple. So what do you think happened to the Ark of the Covenant? <clears throat> if you were the priests in the temple and you see the Babylonian army all around the city and they're working on the walls, you know they're going to get in. It's just a matter of time. What would you do as a body of priests in the temple? Would you just let it sit there till they came? Maybe. Or would you do something? Now, if you were going to hide it, where would you hide it? <clears throat> okay. Under the floor of the temple, maybe. Remove some of those large paving stones and hollow out a space down there. Because then, you see, you don't have to carry it anywhere. If you carry it outside the temple, a lot of people are going to see, right? And they can say, oh, well, it went over there. They tell the Babylonians, so the Babylonians got in. Oh, it went over there. They put it in that house over there, that warehouse. No, okay, nobody saw it. So it disappeared at night. Maybe the priests buried it in the Temple Mount. In which case... It's still there. And uh, I think some people have a hunch where it is. The trouble is, the present Jewish government 
Um, and the government wouldn't want to do this anyways. Or the present Jewish religious bodies can't mine under the Temple Mount because it's in the, you know, uh, I don't want to say jurisdiction. The Jews actually control the Temple Mount, but they have given control over to the Palestinians. Uh, and uh, so they would be totally against any kind of work going on in, uh, you know, in the Temple Mount. Okay, so, you know, uh, the best guess I think is that the ark is actually buried on the Temple Mount. And who knows what may happen, you know, in the coming days and weeks and years as the Jews move to reestablish, you know, another uh, temple. So anyways, the city is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. They break up the two bronze pillars. The temple is burning. All of the gold would run down. And I'm sure the Babylonian soldiers, like the Roman soldiers later, would pry the stones apart to get the melted gold out. Um, this is a small picture, but you might be able to uh, see the uh, Babylonians there working on the pillars, okay? You know, smashing them up into pieces and to take that bronze, that very, very valuable bronze, uh, back to Babylon to make things out of it. And one of them's working on the laver over here. Um, and uh, uh, the captives leaving Jerusalem, a cartoonish uh, version of it. And uh, then uh, a bigger uh, portrait size thing of, um, now all of the uh, citizens of Judah are leaving this time, almost all of them. It says that uh, Nebuzaradan left a few vine dressers in the land to take care of the land. There were a few people left behind, but the majority now are shipped off to Babylon because this is a third visit and uh, after all, you can't expect Nebuchadnezzar to be more patient than he has been. He's been around the Fertile Crescent three times now to um, you know, solve this problem. And uh, the next thing they would see after 900 miles of trekking around the Fertile Crescent would be the fabulous gates of Ishtar welcoming them to Babylon. What would be the first thing that the Jews would see on their way to Babylon? They would see the gates of Ishtar, the fabulous gates of Ishtar, which have been preserved in different museums. And you get to see the fabulous royal blue of the glazed tiles of Babylon and the golden lions, okay, in all their glory. And it's uh, really quite a sight uh, and uh, would have made a fabulous uh, welcome to Babylon. Uh, now, there's one thing I want to uh, make clear at this point, and that is that we see from the history of Israel that God deals with sin. Uh, the northern kingdom of Israel fell into idolatry, and it was dealt with by the Assyrians in a terrible way, uh, because they just could not repent, would not repent of their idolatry. The southern kingdom fell into idolatry, and God allowed the Babylonians to come and wreak havoc with them and indeed to transport them to Babylon temporarily. But God had plans for the, for the southern two tribes because don't forget the Messiah had to come from Judah, okay? So he couldn't just demolish you know, Judah and let it uh, sort of evaporate and assimilate. Uh, he had to deal with them and bring them back, but they don't know that. Now Jeremiah though, back in Jerusalem, writes a letter to the settlers in Babylon. And basically he tells them this, that they're gonna be there for 70 years, so make yourselves at home. He said, buy houses, build gardens, uh, make uh, vineyards, uh, make wine, marry your children off to each other, good Jewish uh, boys and girls, okay? And uh, make yourself at home in Babylon, all right? And, and uh, they did, they started to do that. In fact, Daniel mentions Jeremiah's letter it's always interesting to see when you see different parts of Scripture mentioned in other parts. And Daniel mentions Jeremiah's letter. He says, we're aware of Jeremiah's letter that told us we're going to be here for 70 years in chapter 8 of Daniel. Okay, so uh, there's a nice uh, full picture of the gates of Ishtar just to impress you with the glories of Babylon, okay? And uh, if you were a poor Jewish refugee, you might have been very impressed with this. And notice how high the walls are. They're actually quite, you know, high. It's it's, it, it takes a lot of material, a lot of construction, a lot of skill to build walls that high, and they did. Now, Jeremiah wrote to the, cap, the captives, and uh, I think I've just covered it. 
uh, they were to make up for the sabbatical years that they had not observed back, back in Judah. And there were 70 of those years, and so they were going to be parked in Babylon for 70 years. Now, that seems to say something, that they were going to be there for 70 years, and then something would happen after that. In other words, they weren't going to be there for 200 years necessarily, okay? That 70 years was kind of a measuring rod, and when that 70 years was up, something would happen. What would happen? Nobody would know. Now, I also want to, to impress you with the idea that when you are under the hand of God, and he's dealing with you, and he's allowing punishment to fall on you, okay, your reaction is very important, Okay, you can rebel, you can fight. That's what Zedekiah did. Where did that get him? Got him with his eyes poked out and his children all dead. Okay, and him uh, eating crumbs under the king's uh, table back in, ba- in Babylon. Um, but you can also accept the punishment and see what God wants you to learn from it. And uh, so uh, the southern Jews, they, they turned more in that direction. They were a little more open to uh, learning what God had Uh, for them after their years of idolatry. And so Jeremiah writes, hey, make yourselves at home. You're going to be there for 70 years. But he doesn't say what's going to happen after that. Now, if you were in Babylon and you were Jewish and you wanted to get back, how would you do that? Well, you'd have to like fight the Babylonians, sneak away from them, leave them, you know, run away. How would you do that? It would be difficult, right? Okay. Well, God had a plan that they never could have imagined to get them back to Jerusalem, okay? But he hasn't told them yet. He's just telling them one step at a time. And as God moves in your life, and as you know, you move through life, and you know, a, a different obstacles present themselves, or even punishments, um, you may not understand, and you may not want you know, to undergo that thing, but God is in a process, and he's bringing you along step by step, And sometimes you could never imagine the wild, crazy things that he's going to uh, lead you into. And I could give you personal testimony about that, but uh, we'll we'll lay that aside for another day. But just let it be said that, you know, in in my own experience, you know, God has some crazy wild plans uh, that uh, aren't necessarily the same as yours and that, that I could never have thought of, could never have dreamed of them myself. Okay, so coming back to these characters, um, Jeremiah writes to them, he, he says, you know, just take it easy, settle down. And uh, then uh, the Babylonian Empire continues during the 500s BC, but Nebuchadnezzar's son or grandson, Belshazzar, uh, commits a boo-boo, a big one, okay? And what he does is this. He's having a banquet, as kings were wont to do, with all his officers and officials, and he's going to have a lot of wine, he's going to have a lot of entertainment, going to have a lot of food, going to have, uh, you know, a spectacular event. And to make it even more spectacular, he drags out some of the golden vessels, cups, bowls, from the temple in Jerusalem that they were holding in their warehouses in Babylon as trophies, as loot, okay? He brings them out and he serves them to his concubines, his wives, his pagan associates, and they're hooping it up and drinking out of the the golden bowls from Jerusalem. Well, apparently the Lord did not like that. And a hand appeared over by the wall, okay? Now imagine that, a hand appears and it starts writing out letters, okay? Uh, and the letters were something like Mini, Mini, Tico, Upharsin, okay? And uh, of course, everybody's disturbed. What, what is that, you know, this hand writing on the wall? And what are those letters, what does that mean? Everybody's disturbed and I think it was one of the uh, queens or one of the women said, well, uh, you know, your majesty, you have somebody uh, in, uh, your, uh, in your government, he's kind of an old man now, uh, I think his name is Daniel, and uh, he sometimes was able to interpret dreams and stuff. Why don't you ask him? So they got Daniel up, out of bed. It was, was way past his bedtime. This is like midnight. They're partying, you know, all night. And uh, they bring him in to read the signs, and uh, he's able to interpret them. 
And this is the interpretation of each word. Meaning, God has numbered your kingdom, Babylonian king, and finished it. Tico, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. In Daniel chapter 5, this incident takes place. Okay? And the Medes and the Persians, they were the next empire. All right? And you know that in Daniel, there's two passages where God gives this uh, uh, figure, this statue, and it's got five empires in it, right? The, the gold head is uh, ba- ba- Babylon. Uh, the silver soul shoulders are uh, Persia me- media. Uh, the uh, belly is uh, Greece. Uh, and the legs and feet are Rome, okay? Uh, I don't know how the Assyrians got left out of that statue, by the way. I, I sort of, as, as a student of history, I kind of regret that. Like, if I was doing the statue, I'd t- tack on the Assyrians up at the, you know, make them the hair or something. Uh, to get them in this statue. Okay, they're not there. Uh, and uh, what's happening is uh, the Babylonian uh, emperor, Belshazzar, is warned by Daniel. You imagine poor old Daniel. He, you, know, he, you know, he's sleepy and grumpy. He said, what am I getting me out of bed for, you know? What? What? What hand? What, what are you talking about? What writing? Oh, that writing? And I'm not sure if it was Hebrew or Aramaic, Okay. Uh, but he knew both of them. And he says, well, let me see. Let me adjust my spectacles here and see what this says. You know, mini, mini, tico, you farson. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, Belshazzar, you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> okay. Uh, your kingdom has been divided. And the next comers, the next imperial, you know, risers, the Persians and the Medes, they're going to get your kingdom. And I don't know if it was that same night But uh, Herodotus records that uh, Cyrus, the Persian leader, uh, he wasn't sure how to get into Babylon. The walls were so high, it was so well fortified, they were so strong. You know, it cost him so many troops and stuff to get in, to fight his way in. So he's, you know, casting around for a more creative solution. And he comes up with one. See, Babylon was built on the Euphrates River. It was built over the river. And the solution that he comes up with, he said, let's dam up the river, uh, you know, a mile or so upstream where they can't see. And uh, at a certain point in a certain night, in the middle of the night, we'll close the dam to divert the water from the riverbed, okay, that flows under the city, all right? And we will enter the city under the walls on the riverbed. And that's precisely what they did. And they were able to take over the whole city in one night. In one night, it's sort of the Babylonian Empire fell like that. It was dramatic. It was sudden. Uh, you know, everybody was not expecting anything like that. They thought it would be a prolonged war, you know, between the Persians and the Babylonians. And it wasn't. It was sudden. And uh, that was because God had, you know, uh, decided against the Babylonians that their time was enough. They're getting too arrogant. They're messing around with my temple vessels. And uh, I'm not going to put up with that. And uh, so the Babylonian Empire fell. And Daniel is still intact. Daniel is still part of the government. And uh, he's even part of the new government under Cyrus. And let's see what Cyrus did, okay? Uh, Now, here's the writing on the wall. We learn that empires come and go. And they all have their day. And uh, I don't know, they vary between, you know, sort of like 200 years and, and 500 years. Uh, they don't last too long, usually, okay? And uh, so uh, whatever empire you're part of, uh, the question is, how long will it last, okay? Uh, and it's very interesting that if you uh, take a look at the history of the U.S., uh, it is an empire that has 50 parts, right? States, okay? And uh, they were added on one by one, right? You know, so it was an empire. And there, some were bought, some were conquered, uh, some uh, added voluntarily, and... Uh, There's a few other territories, too, that are sort of linked with us. Um, But it's like, you know, the United Empire States of America, okay? Uh, And Canada's the same thing, although not as strong. Uh, It has 10 parts or provinces. And the provinces all squabble among themselves up there in Canada. They don't like each other. And uh, they they threaten, you know, uh, uh, every once in a while to leave what they call confederation. Confederation is the uh, alliance that, that holds the Canadian provinces together in a country, okay? And uh, so they might uh, 
uh, they might want it, you know, like uh, Quebec, where I came from in Montreal. They, you know, threaten to leave every once in a while. Alberta threatens to leave every once in a while. It would like to be its own province. British Columbia, too, sometimes. So empires come and go, and uh, what we learn is God does deal with uh, individuals and with empires, and he deals with their sin, and you must be very careful how you react to God's dealing, okay, with you. Uh, <clears throat> the Jewish uh, captives settled into Babylon uh, could not know what God was preparing for them at the end of these 70 years in Babylon. They might have wondered how they would ever be able to leave Babylon and return to Judah. It would be humanly impossible. If you had told them that someone would come along and capture Babylon with its elaborate walls and fortifications in one night and would then allow the Jews to return home and would even help them rebuild their temple, they would have laughed their heads off at you. But that is exactly what happened. Only God could have arranged such unlikely events, okay? And in Isaiah, now we have to pull Isaiah into this. We've had uh, 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles, uh, Daniel, Jeremiah, and now we've got to get uh, Isaiah involved. A uh, hundred years before the fact, uh, Isaiah was led to call a figure, a historical figure that he didn't even know yet, Cyrus, God's anointed one. Well, anointed one in Hebrew is Mashiach, okay? And guess what word that is? That's the word for Messiah. In other words, Cyrus here, this unknown historical figure a hundred years before, okay, predicted by Isaiah blindly, like Isaiah doesn't know what's going on here. He says, God told me somebody called Cyrus is coming and that he's going to be God's anointed one. He's going to be a Mashiach, a Messiah, all right? He's got a mission. He's got a job to do. And that's why he's God's Messiah. Is he a good Jew? No. He's a good Persian, okay? Conqueror. Uh, apparently, God uses other people outside his own community of people than, than are not, maybe not Christians or maybe not Jewish people. And here he's using Cyrus, and uh, he calls him his anointed one. And uh, in uh, Isaiah 44 and 45, you can check it out for yourself in those chapters. God refers to Cyrus, the famous Persian conqueror, as his anointed one, her Messiah, and says he's going to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Who says of Ty Cyrus, uh, he is my shepherd. This is God speaking in Isaiah. And he shall perform all my pleasure, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built. Okay, Jerusalem, you shall be built. Okay, or rebuilt. And to the temple, your foundation shall be laid, Isaiah 44. So the uh, city is going to be rebuilt, and the temple by Cyrus, or indirectly by Cyrus. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held. Okay, so God held hands with Cyrus. You know, they were chummy, all right? God is using this guy, picking him up out of history because of his, probably because of his personal qualities and char characteristics and achievements, and he's going to use, and his open-mindedness, and he's going to use him to further his own plans, okay? Uh, and uh, whose right hand I have held so to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut, Isaiah 45, verse 1. <clears throat> so, Cyrus had already conquered a lot of territory around Babylon, and Babel, Babylon City was like the last stop, okay? And he conquers that at the end, and so he's got a complete, pretty complete empire, including the little old province of Judah, which has been practically wiped out now, okay, for a hundred years. And uh, I always like to tell this story that uh, Cyrus one day is walking in the streets of Babylon, okay, like he captured Babylon, right? So this is his beautiful new capital city. And by the way, the Persians were horse soldiers. They were a horse culture. You understand what that means? What that means is they didn't live in houses. They didn't dwell in cities. They didn't like cities, okay? Um, and uh, so Cyrus is a, uh, you know, consummate horse general, horse warrior. You know, they used mounted archers, and uh, that was how they beat their enemies usually. And uh, so uh, he's already conquered all, all the territories of Babylon and Assyria, 
and he, he winds up with Babylon. He's walking down the street one day, and he sees these strange people. Okay, and he says, uh, who are you guys? And they said, well, we're Jews from Jerusalem. He said, what's Jerusalem? Well, it's a city that was wiped out over there by the Babylonians, 800 miles away. And we used to have a temple there. We used to pray to God, and God, you know, the God of the universe, the invisible God of the universe is our God. Now, something wonderful had happened to the Jews in the 70 years in Babylon. You know what it was? They gave up their, what they need to give up? Their idolatry. They were cured once and for all of their idolatry. When they went in, they were idolaters. When they came out, they were idol free. And not only that, but somewhere along the line, somebody ordered the scrolls, the Torah and the Tanakh, sent over to Babylon. Now, a lot of the Jews stayed in Babylon. They didn't go back to Jerusalem. Some went back, some stayed. The ones who stayed got the scrolls and got busy studying and reproducing them in Babylon. Not in Jerusalem, in Babylon. They started yeshivas, schools to study the scriptures. They hadn't had that before. Didn't know what to do, you know? They never met and read scriptures before. It was supposed to be read once a year to the king, but, you know, sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't. But now, in Babylon, they start the regular organized study of Torah, okay? And then other guys start writing commentaries about the Torah. And they collected the commentaries and put them into volumes called the Talmud, okay? And that started accumulating, and eventually they would accumulate, would you believe this, 44 volumes of the Talmud. That's the commentaries, okay? And in Babylon, what else did they invent? Invent. They invented, if you get 10 Jewish men together, you can have a quorum, and you can start a group, a prayer Bible study group that might be called eventually a synagogue. A synagogue, 10 Jewish men. Okay? And they started that in Babylon. They started synagogues in Babylon. Now, what's the significance? Well, the significance says in the synagogues, they don't sacrifice animals. No blood sacrifice. No priests. The men that sort of, you know, govern the synagogue are learned men. They're students of the word. They're not in the priestly line of Levi. You understand? So the synagogues get going, the yeshivas get going, all in Babylon, and the Talmud, okay? So in other words, uh, Judaism takes a gigantic step in Babylon, you know, toward becoming a a, a world-class religion, not so much in size or extent yet, or population, but in uh, in its uh, infrastructure, that it had a theology, okay, Uh, which was coherent and made some kind of sense you understand? The, the significance of this is a big deal, Babylon. It's, it's supposed to be, you know, I, you know, that they're captured and, you know, submissive, and it turns into like a huge, you know, um, plus for Judaism, okay? Because they come out of it, like I said, with synagogues, yeshivas, rabbis, okay, Pharisees, and the Pharisees were not always, you know, bad guys, uh, spoiling everybody's fun. They, they were devoted students of the word and they tried to practice the word and yeah, sometimes they got carried away. But, you know, they were also good guys sometimes too, the Pharisees. And all of this comes out of Babylon. But um, Cyrus is walking around and he says, so you guys are Jewish? You come from where? Jerusalem. Uh, oh, wait, really? Yeah, and what did you guys do over there? Well, we did, you know, this and that, a little bit of trade, a little bit of this and that. And we had a temple and we used to pray. We offer sacrifices for the kings. They let it slip out, okay? We used to offer sacrifices for the kings and pray for the kings. Uh, That got Cyrus's attention, okay? And he says to himself, well, you know, he's balancing. He's doing a little bit of accounting in his head. And this province and that empire that's, you know, over here, this province is here and income from this and that. And he he says, "Um, you know, And he has a long conversation with them, and they seem to know what they're talking about. And he finally says to them, look, I tell you what, uh, why don't I finance you guys going back to Jerusalem 
so you can rebuild the city eventually and rebuild your temple right away and say prayers for me and my sons, okay? Cyrus was a religious man. He was probably Zoroastrian. The Zoroastrians did not believe in a lot of pagan idols. They believed in two gods, one of evil, one of uh, light, okay? And you, you had to help the god of light in the struggle, the cosmic struggle against evil, okay? And he says, uh, calculatingly, you know, maybe I'll send you guys back. Would you like to go back? Well, some of them would. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, like we go. And he says, I'll send you guards and soldiers and money and camels and stuff. And uh, they didn't take all that stuff, but he, uh, eventually some of them started back with Zerubbabel in 538 B.C., and they get back to Jerusalem, and they did start the foundation of the temple. Now they got discouraged once in a while, and they would stop. And then somebody would come along like Haggai, okay, in the Old Testament, and tell them, hey, come on, guys, get going on this temple, okay, get it done. And finally, about 515 BC, they complete the, which is it now? The first temple? The second temple, okay? Uh, and uh, they get going on that. Uh, and unfortunately, it wasn't as beautiful as uh, the glorious first temple. And I'm going to show you a diagram here because I've uh, talked to you about most of this stuff here. Uh, and here's a diagram comparing the three temples, okay? Uh, actually, two of them are the second temple. But there's the Temple of Solomon, about 1000 BC, and it lasts till 586 BC, okay? And uh, then the temple of Zerubbabel is smaller, not as glorious. The old timers cried when they saw it because it wasn't as wonderful as uh, their uh, first temple of Solomon. And then much later, much later during the lifetime of Jesus and after, after his death and resurrection, Herod, okay, uh, sort of tore the second temple apart, the temple of Zerubbabel, and over it built a magnificent, wonderful, seven wonders of the world kind of attraction, uh, a uh, second temple, if you like. It counted as the second temple. Um, and he built that at great expense and great magnificence. And it was one of the wonders of the world. That's the temple that Jesus sat inside. And his disciples invited him to admire the buildings. And you remember what he said, okay? Um, and uh, so there's the, uh, if you like, th three temples, but the, the second and third temple, they, they only count as the second temple, okay? So now we have two temples, and you must be wondering by now, like, what's this guy going to get us to here? Okay, we're going to see very quickly uh, the second temple and its platform, uh, and of course, Her Herod you know, built this. If you've ever been to Jerusalem and you've, you've been to the Temple Mount, the Temple Mount is astonishing. It's incredible in its size and its, you know, grandeur. Uh, I'm talking about the Temple Mount itself, you know, like the Western Wall and, and the, the whole platform. Never mind the stuff that's on it, the, the buildings that are on it. Just the Temple Mount itself is fantastic, I think, okay? And uh, here's a close-up of uh, Herod's temple. It's, it's classified as the second temple, uh, but it's built by Herod the Great. And uh, it was uh, only finished after Jesus had uh, been crucified and risen from the dead. And um, of course, we know and you know what's going to happen to this second temple. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> is it possible that there might be a third temple? Well, let's see, okay? Uh, a third temple. Is it possible? Now, uh, what happened to the second temple was, of course, that the Romans destroyed it in 70 AD, 70 to 72 AD. And, uh, uh, you know, that was a terrible tragedy for the Jewish nation. Uh, but you have to remember something from God's point of view, okay? Uh, and that is that he had provided his son, the Messiah, Jesus, to die on the cross as a sacrifice for the sins of all mankind for all of history, okay? Uh, and if they would simply ask for it the way that the Israelites had looked at the snake on the stick, you know, back in uh, the book of Numbers, and asked for, uh, uh, you know, salvation from the snake, they would have the, the you, know, uh, uh, you know, be saved from the snake poison. 
And in the same method, if you look at the Messiah up on the cross and call upon him, uh, he will save you from your sin and give you eternal life. Now, God had done that, and in the uh, decades following the uh, resurrection of Jesus, um, God is watching the temple still offering these sacrifices. Now, these are animal sacrifices, and they no longer have any validity because the great sacrifice of Jesus has been made. So guess what? God allows history to take its course. The zealots want to fight the Romans. Too bad, okay? Shouldn't do that. Don't fight the Romans. I have a piece of advice for you, okay? Uh, don't pick a fight with the Romans. And uh, <clears throat> they, um, they, they get destroyed. Not only that, the uh, Roman general actually pauses at the temple gates and says, hey, do you want to surrender now and uh, save your temple? And they, they did not want to save their temple. Maybe they did, but they, they wanted to fight on and, and die fighting. So uh, the Romans fought their way into the temple, and it caught fire, and the gold melted between the stones, and it was uprooted, and not one stone left on another. As who had prophesied 40 years before? Jesus. And his followers, the Christians, got out of Dodge City before the Romans closed in. They used his advice, his prophecy, his prediction, and they said, you know, Jesus said, it's going to be not one stone left on another. Here come the Romans. They're outside the gates. They're breaking in. Let's get out of here. So the Christians cleared out. Now, they were supposed to be Jews and supposed to be loyal. And the zealots, of course, did not like that. And they actually killed some of the Christians on their way out. So Jews were killing Christians in 70 to 72 AD. You won't see that in most accounts of uh, the uh, destruction of the second temple. Now, the second temple is destroyed, and uh, we go 2,000 years. We're going to skip 2,000 years. And you go visit Israel today, and you may see groups of guys like these in white robes, and they're practicing third temple rituals. Now, do they have a third temple? No. They are hoping to get a third temple, to be able to build it on the Temple Mount beside the Al-Aqsa Mosque, I believe, okay? Now, that's a tall order. The Muslims, obviously, would be very, very upset, uh, and uh, they're hoping that somebody can assuage the Muslims to, you know, calm down and share the, the platform. After all, they, the Jews, were there first. There's no doubt they have a right to it, but we would admit that, but the Muslims would not. And uh, so it's hard to tell that they would ever be able to do that, but they hope to, and they meet, and they practice, okay? So there's groups of Jewish people that are practicing for the third temple. Do you believe that? They are. They take it seriously. Now, the Jewish government wants nothing to do with that. They don't want anything to do with any temples or any religion, you know, because they don't want to upset the Muslims, okay? They're a secular government. They want peace and quiet. And this religious stuff, you know, is always riling people up, okay? And so they don't want any part of a third temple, but some of these religious Jews do want their temple back and are willing to build it and finance it and practice for it. So there they are. And there's a character, one of the characters, and you can see he's celebrating, okay? Is, does that look like Cyril? That doesn't look like Cyril, does it? A little bit, tiny bit, in the eyes there. Huh? Where's, where's Pastor Frank? Pastor Frank, did you leave me? Abandon me in my hour of need. Okay, there you are back there. Does that look like Cyril, Pastor Frank? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. And there's his idealized temple. Of course, that temple is not built. Okay, it does not exist. It's not there. But in his imagination, in this picture, uh, it is there. That's what they're working for. Uh, now, beware, because the Antichrist is also coming. Uh, there's coming a time of tribulation on the earth. And the Jewish people will go through this tribulation, and during it, uh, this suave, princely figure, probably from Europe, is going to convince them that he will take care of them, and he's going to sign a treaty with them, and uh, they're going to feel all peaceful and secure uh, in Jerusalem and in Israel with this treaty, with this uh, suave, he's not going to call himself the Antichrist, you know, this suave, debonair, <clears throat> uh, good talker, uh, politician from probably from Europe. Okay, maybe from Rome. Uh, and he's going to work out this treaty. Now, this is Daniel that says this. I'll read it to you in here in just a second. 
And uh, then we have to see what happens to the treaty. And it's all written out in Daniel chapter 9. Verse 27, Daniel says, or he predicts, or he sees prophetically, then he, that's this prince, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, the week is a week of years, seven years. And Daniel, as you know, he plays around with the whole idea of 70 weeks of years and 62 plus nine, and you know, he he added up different ways. And he's he's playing around with the last week now of history. And, uh, but in the middle of the week, okay, that's the seven day, seven year period, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Now, it does not say in this passage that there will be a third temple. What it says is he's going to finish the sacrifice and offering. Well, where do the Jewish people make sacrifices and offerings? Do they do it in a synagogue? No, maybe offerings of money, but not offerings of grain or anything like that. And certainly no sacrifices. There's no blood sacrifice, no slain, you know, lamb's blood in the synagogues, right? So this can only take place in what? A temple. All right. And so this is the clue. There's not a lot of scriptural evidence. But this is the clue that there is a third temple that we don't know much about, okay? But that Antichrist is going to cut off from uh, sacrifice and offering in the middle of the tribulation. And then he's going to rip into the Jews. And he's going to put them through a terrible, you know, uh, persecution. Uh, They're going to flee to the wilderness. They're going to flee to Petra. And uh, he's going to pursue after them and kill a lot of them. One third will survive and we'll see Messiah coming with nail prints in his hands that they're going to ask him, where'd you, you know, where'd you get those holes in your hands, you know? And he's going to have an answer for them, okay? And they're going to come to Messiah, to faith in Messiah at that time and be saved. Um, so uh, I believe there's going to be a third temple, all right? And that that will be the temple in the, during the tribulation and the temple that um, the Antichrist will, uh, will uh, destroy, probably. Now, I'll read you another passage that I didn't get time to put in on slides, and it's from 2 Thessalonians. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin, okay, which is another title for the Antichrist, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, okay? And that's that terrible, terrific passage from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that description of the man of sin or the man of perdition and uh, how he sets himself up in the temple as God. What temple would that be? It has to be the third temple, all right? So I postulate to you, I submit to you, that there are one, two, three temples, okay? The third temple is not, you know, heavily uh, documented, uh, but it seems to be there on the basis of Daniel 9 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, because the man of sin uh, is going to do certain things, important things, with and in that, that third temple. All right, now, okay, Are there any more temples? We got three temples so far, all right? Are there any more temples? Well, we have a problem with Ezekiel. He's 48 chapters long, okay? He has a lot of visions. Some of his visions are hard to understand. This one at the end of his book is the most difficult to understand, especially for people who do not believe in the millennium, okay? Now, the millennium is a thousand year period described in Revelation 20. And it's mentioned six times, okay? How many times does God have to tell you something to make you believe that it's going to happen? Oh, I don't believe in the millennium. That's just a fairy tale. That's just a, a bunch of, you know, pre turbers They made that up. It's not in the Bible. What, wait a second, not in the Bible. You better read Revelation 20. And it says six times, I know I've only got five fingers here, six times that Jesus will reign for a thousand years. Satan will be bound up, okay? at the bottom of the pit, and uh, there will be, uh, according to many Old Testament passages, like uh, Isaiah chapter 10, for example, where the wolf lies down with the lamb, okay, and passages like that, 
that there will be a wonderful idyllic time of a thousand year period, you know, in the future of the world. It'll come after the revela- after tribulation and after Jesus returns, the second return with his armies of heaven. And he will, a la Psalm chapter two, rule with, and Psalm 110, rule with a rod of iron. He's gonna rule the world with a rod of iron. And he's gonna fix all the problems and uh, it'll be an idyllic time for a thousand years. We will rule with him, uh, okay, if we uh, make it there and, uh, you know, uh, don't disobey too much and, and keep our rewards. Some of your rewards will be ruling in the millennium. Now, um, okay, we've got a, ch- a chunk of Ezekiel, eight chapters, okay? So take those eight chapters and feel them in your Bible, okay, how substantial they are. And <clears throat> most of the church says, these eight chapters are just so much fairy tale, okay? They don't really uh, count for anything. Now, they are a detailed description of a temple, okay? Uh, it's not the first temple, Solomon's temple. It's not the second temple under Zerubbabel. The measurements don't, uh, you know, measure. And they, 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 you know, nobody ever set up a temple like they set up here in Ezekiel. And it's not Herod's temple, okay? It's a temple which has never been built yet. Oh my, okay? Would it be the temple in the tribulation, the Antichrist? No, because this one is not cursed by Antichrist. He doesn't enter into it, okay? It's uh, the prince, the Messiah, comes into this temple. And I have decided to call it the millennial temple. In his, now, of course, I'm not the only one. There's a whole, you know, tribe out there of theologians who believe that Ezekiel is describing the millennial temple that Jesus is going to build when he comes back to earth in Jerusalem. And he's going to rule the world from this temple. He's going to sit on the throne because he is the son of God and he's fit to do that. Okay. And uh, he will rule with the rod of iron, no fooling around, no back talk, okay? If you, uh, you know, uh, talk back, you get the rod, the, the iron rod, all right? And uh, so he's going to solve all the society's problems for a thousand years and rule from, you know, this, this temple, this millennial temple. Read about it in Ezekiel, okay? And so I submit to you that that is the fourth temple, the fourth temple, okay? Let's count them again. What do we got? Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel, Herod's temple, the second one. Uh, the third temple, we think, we're gonna keep an open mind, maybe, maybe we're wrong. In fact, one of my slides, and I've lost track of it now, said uh, for this millennial temple, is it this one? One of them said, uh, one of them says third temple. In other words, they count this temple, the millennial temple, as the third temple, not a fourth. And so they skip the one in the tribulation, okay? So that's, I I say to you, that's the one that's the least documented in the Bible. You've got two passages, you know, Daniel 9 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that talk about an antichrist figure, you know, doing bad things in this temple, stopping the sacrifice, sitting on the throne like God, okay? That has to be a temple. So I I think that's the third temple. Now this, that would make the millennial temple, temple number four, count them, okay? Four temples. Uh, And uh, you know, it it, just for your information, uh, it's interesting to see that. Now, buildings are not important to God. God allowed them to be built and allowed himself to be worshiped in them and through them. But uh, Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman who said, uh, you know, we worship here on this mountain, uh, said to her, well, you know, a time is coming and nobody's going to worship on this mountain or even in Jerusalem uh, because God is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's what he wants. He wants people to worship in his spirit and truth. It does not say in a building or in a temple. Okay. You do not need to be in a temple or a building to worship God. You don't need to be in this building. This building is a convenience, okay? It's a shelter, nothing more. There's nothing sacred about any of the stuff in this building, except for the Coke machine, okay? (laughs) 
which I am partial to. Um, but this, seriously, this is very important. What if the authorities came and arrested us, arrested our pastors, and you guys were all split up like chickens, you know, uh, running on the mountainside there, sheep lost, okay? Well, hopefully you would, you know, get together here and there in a house, in a basement, in a backyard, in a garage, and continue to study the Word and worship God uh, on your own with whatever leaders emerged, okay, from. And uh, that you would worship two ways, in spirit, as the Spirit leads you, and in truth. So you would worship with, with right doctrine that you would study the Word for, rightly dividing the Word of God. And so you would stay close to the scriptures. You don't need to be in a building, you know, and pray to stained glass windows or statues. Um, you want to be close to the scriptures, and that could be anywhere. And then also in spirit, you want the Holy Spirit to lead you in your worship. Uh, what would the Holy Spirit lead you to? He would lead you to giving thanks to God, uh, enjoying his salvation, okay, and uh, having communion. Do this in remembrance of me. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you into the Word. He's going to guide you in the Word, John 16. And He's going to instruct you in the Word. And um, that's what it would mean to worship in, in, in spirit and in truth. And you can do those things anywhere. Are you worshiping these days? Somewhere? At home? By your desk? <laughs> Turn the TV off? Read the Word, ask the Holy Spirit to talk to you from His Word, and you'll be surprised what happens as you worship Him in spirit and in truth. Um, so many believe that Ezekiel's temple is going to be the Messiah's millennial temple. We'll see. I, I think it will be. And uh, I, I think that we'll all go up to Jerusalem to rejoice and worship. Jesus will give us jobs to do there. He may tell some of you, I want you to go back to Bakersfield and run the waterworks there, okay? Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, make sure the farms have lots of water, all right? Uh, or uh, someplace else. And he's going to give us all jobs to do. In one of his parables, he talks about giving cities to his disciples. What is that about? Giving cities? Who gets a city? Well, Jesus said his disciples are going to get cities, all right? What city are you going to get? Man, oh man, I hope I'm ready. I don't know if I'm ready to rule a city, okay? But some people, some disciples are going to get cities. Uh, but I have bad news for you. There won't be any temple in heaven because uh, heaven doesn't need a light. It has light from the Lamb and light from the Father. And the temple is heaven itself. And you're in the presence of God and his son Jesus and so you don't need a lot of the things that you used to need on earth. But I will tell you this much, you do need a new body to be up there, okay? Some people say, well, you know, maybe I'll make it into heaven and, you know, I'll see, I'll do some good deeds and I hope I'll get to heaven, you know, sort of thing. Uh, no, you don't. You don't want to go to heaven if you don't have a new body. You don't want to go to heaven. Uh, what was Isaiah's reaction in Isaiah 6 when uh, the cherubim came toward him with, you know, the coals of fire? And, you know, he heard them saying, holy, holy, holy. His, his reaction was to get away, okay? He, you know, he couldn't take that heat from these cherubim in the presence of God. He couldn't be in the presence of God, you know, as he was. And so they, they had to symbolically cleanse his mouth, you know, with the coals before he could be there in the presence of God. And uh, so we need a new body before we go to heaven. How do you get that new body? You ask for it from Jesus. You ask for eternal life from him. And he gives you eternal life. And uh, you will get a new body at the point where he calls us up to heaven to be with him. And uh, that new body will uh, enable you to be in heaven. It's like a spacesuit. You couldn't go into space without, you know, you know, all these silly space movies. You can't, you can't. Space is very hostile. It's not a nice place, okay? It'll kill you. Um, and, uh, you know, one little leak in your suit. So you need to be specially equipped to go into space, don't you? And you wouldn't say, expect any less to go to heaven. You need to be specially equipped to go to heaven. Now the question then is, after all this, you know, uh, interesting study on the temples of Israel. 
um, is, is your you know, space suit ready to go to heaven? Have you got your new body uh, stored up for you? And uh, you know, have you done business with Jesus in order to uh, be able to go to heaven? Because he will take you and he will uh, make it appropriate for you to be there. Uh, but otherwise, remember some of those parables, the wedding feast, and the guy sneaks in and he doesn't have the new wedding clothes. Remember that? And uh, the master of the wedding saw him and said, what are you doing here? Well, I just, you know, sneaked in. Well, get out of here. And he kicks him out of the wedding, you know. Um, so you don't want to be kicked out of the wedding. And uh, you want uh, Jesus to e- equip you with your spacesuit to be in heaven. In other words, with your new body and your new uh, will and uh, your new mind. Uh, and let's uh, thank him as we close. And uh, for these things, uh, the temples are marvelous, but what's even more marvelous is uh, him preparing a place for us in heaven, John 14. Uh, he's, uh, Jesus is preparing a, a, a room, a place for you in heaven, and he's going to come back to get you, if you belong to him, to get you to be with him in heaven. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence now, and we uh, just pray we've uh, done a lot of work together, we're tired out. We pray that you will be glorified and uplifted by this. We pray that you'll uh, be with all of these people here, make of them ambassadors for your glory uh, during the week to come. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.